Uh, our next speaker is Ben Kernman from the University of Miami. Right. So, whenever you're ready, Ben. I'm ready. So hopefully you can hear me. I think you would tell me if you couldn't. Um, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, speak with you today. Um, I want to underscore something really important for this discussion. Um, I do have uh, degrees in, a, in applied mathematics uh, from the last millennium. Uh, so, so I haven't been a practicing math mathematician for a very, very long time. So you'll have to forgive me. But what I really want to talk about today is how uh, AI and, and uh, machine learning uh, is a potential uh, in terms of revolutionizing weather and uh, climate science, and in prediction, and in particular, prediction of extreme events. And so I want to talk a little bit about that today. The first thing I want to bring up is what's the challenge that we're we're dealing with, and so I want to talk a little bit, just give you some background on some of the, the issues that we worry about. Um, uh, one of the things that I, I think uh, uh, as climate scientists, we're, we're, we're not doing a very good job, but we're, we're starting to think about this and do this better and think about that uh, when you think about weather and climate, it's really a continuum. And uh, we've, we've put up these artificial boundaries between weather and climate, and I think that makes it difficult for the public to understand climate change and how uh, that's going to affect weather, because it's really the weather that uh, people uh, most worry about, so extreme weather events. So we put up these artificial boundaries, and I, wanna, I want us to start thinking about, as a community, start thinking about uh, the need to predict across, across timescales. In the last uh, few years, there have been uh, some pretty big disruptors in uh, weather and uh, uh, climate science. And, and certainly one of those has been advances in computing power. I'm going to show you uh, an example of, of uh, how that's uh, really making a big difference. But uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is, uh, is out there as something that's going to lead to a potential revolution. And uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting that is emerging is that there's communities in, within the weather and climate world that view uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is, is somehow in conflict with uh, first principle uh, modeling of weather and climate. I'm going to I'm going to dig into that a little bit more. What I mean by that, but that this you know the the usual uh, F equals M A approach that has been going on for any number of years is somehow in conflict with data driven uh, approaches. And and I don't see that. I, I I see them actually. The real potential revolution is when we bring those two things together. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a, in just a little bit. So just to, just to help motivate, this is a chart that the federal government produces uh, every year, and it's a, it's a summary of all the weather and uh, climate-related uh, events that have happened throughout the U.S. Uh, that uh, have individually led to more than a billion dollars of uh, impact. Uh, and... One, one thing that I think is, I really want to emphasize with this picture, if you look at it over, you know, last few years, uh, there's no question that tropical storms and hurricanes, and you see a, you see a couple on here, um, have happened uh, in the past and, and, and are, you know, multi-billion dollar events. But we're starting to see a lot more, a lot more of billion dollar events just associated with extreme weather, just extreme weather. So those uh, cloud, lightning, rain, picked circles, those are extreme weather events. And uh, what we see when you look at this chart year over year is those extreme weather events are starting to produce billion dollars worth of damage year over year. And so this sort of summarizes, this is um, the number of events that have happened uh, on the uh, uh, left-hand uh, x uh, y-axis, it shows the number of events, and on the right-hand uh, y-axis, it's showing the cost in billions of dollars that has been uh, adjusted for for inflation, and uh, the colors on the bars 
uh, give you the various different kinds of um, uh, disasters. But what what I think jumps off the page, what really jumps off the page here, is that the green bars, the green bars in the last you know uh, uh, 20 years or so, 15, 20 years or so, are getting much bigger. So there's a lot more just severe storm damages contributing to a significant cost. And so, you know, as a weather and climate scientist, that's an enormous opportunity. Can I understand that? Can I, can I predict these uh, uh, extreme events? And uh, if we had additional warning preparation, can we somehow mitigate some of these costs? So that's really the challenge that we're, we're thinking about. Now, when you think about- What was 2004? What was the peak at 2004? Uh, I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. Maybe you could uh, repeat yeah, that. So question. there was a question on about the peak on 2004, what it meant. Uh, it was actually 2000. Was that's actually 2005. Uh, there was a, a large number of uh, uh, damages in 2005 associated with those tropical cyclone counts. So hopefully that answers your question. Sure. There's another question if it's okay. Sure, sure, please interrupt me as much as you need. Maybe you said it already. What is CPI adjusted? What does CPI stand for? That's inflation adjusted. That's just okay. that that's due to inflation. So you should the idea is the dollar we should be able to compare the dollar amounts from 2024 with the dollar amounts of 1980. So they're comparable. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge, <laughs> it's, a, it's a really fair question. There's a huge debate about what's the right way to adjust this so they're uh, directly comparable. So there's no question that, you know, you could probably argue uh, uh, there's some, you know, uh, uh, some factors in this inflation adjusted that's not not included. But it's there's also no question that those counts, which is the left-hand axis, have, have uh, significantly increased over time. Also so, uses yeah, sure. Can you go back to the previous one? So it's also interesting that the cost is not in correlate. It's it's not in two thousand and five. The cost is not in correlation with with the disasters because you see two thousand seventeen. Uh, the cost is correlated to the disaster, but two thousand and five, it's not. So I just keep wondering about two thousand and seventeen. Well, 2005, if you recall, that was uh, 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 that was Katrina, uh, Rita, yes. and a couple of other storms that were extremely expensive uh, with really wide, widespread damage. So those were um, uh, so that's a, a an extremely busy year for for uh, land falling storms that uh, did a lot of damage. Can you can you come closer? I I just can't hear you. Can you? Yes, sorry. Hi, hi Ben. How are you? Hi. I'm good. How are you? Good, good. The in 2005, uh, if you were here back then, I remember I was a grad student at UM. The university shut down for a month and a half. No, I know what's going on. So yeah, but see here here in yellow, it has the number of storms. But what, what's not being shown is the amount of wind and the, the strength. So that's why I think the correlation is, if no, you know actually- just storm count. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like one or two storms in 2005 were worse than potentially 10 storms in another year. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry, that's, right. Like, no, that's, right. that's right. No, that's right. That's right. Flurry, can I add to this flurry of questions? Is it possible that there's some aspect of this green bars that's like additional reporting? Those maybe existed earlier, but we didn't know, or something like that. Um, there could be a small factor, but I don't think it's too big because um, we had, you know, these are this is not uh, these are not events that are over the ocean. Uh, so if it was over the ocean, then then that would be an issue. Um, we've had uh, pretty good land-based coverage of uh, weather events uh, since the night. 1980s. So I don't think that's a, a big factor. Um, so it could be a little bit, but not a big factor. Uh, 
Bye-bye. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. I, I, I love the questions on this curve. Um, so uh, one of the things that um, uh, when you th when you think about uh, weather and climate risks and you need to uh, interact with people that are making decisions uh, about how to respond and plan and prepare and all of that, um, uh, it's for them, for the decision makers, uh, it's really a continuum of problems. Uh, and uh, so the weather and climate community really needs to come together and think about uh, predicting hazards across a number of different timescales. The problem for us is that 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 the things that uh, lead to potential predictability that we can actually say something can be very different. So, for example, you know the day-to-day -day weather forecasts that you know that your uh, TV uh, weather person reports. You know the forecast skill. You know a day in advance is pretty good. You can can rely on them, uh, but you know five days out, seven days out, the skill falls off uh, rapidly. But you know they can be they can be almost deterministic. They can tell you uh, you know uh, you know pretty much when it's going to rain at what what point during the day it's going to rain. Okay, when you start to go to longer timescales, a few yeah, they always make mistakes. <laughs> I'm sorry. In Miami, they always make mistakes. Well, it's not the <laughs> they make mistakes everywhere. So the uh, the and I'm going to get into a little bit about why that is. Um, there's limits to how accurate we can how accurately we can predict, and that you know that has to do with the fact that we're talking about a a chaotic system. And so, uh, you know, I, I just as an example, I'll get phone calls uh, in my office all the time. Someone will call me up and say, I'm getting married, uh, you know, six months from today. And I want to know if I can have an outdoor wedding. And uh, I, can't, I can't tell them on that particular day if it's going to rain or not. What I can what I can what I can say six months from today is perhaps is the is the probability increased or decreased that it's going to rain uh, that day uh, uh, or that week or that month. Uh, and the same kind of principle uh, should be applied to a, a weather forecast. They should be entirely probabilistic. And in fact, if you look on the web, they, they really are. Uh, you know, if they're going to talk about a forecast five days from today, they should say the probability of uh, a thunderstorm is 60 percent. So though, so if the thunderstorm didn't happen, uh, they're still right. There was the 40 percent chance that it wouldn't happen. So so, yes, we're always wrong. Uh, and at the same time, we're always right. But uh, I come from the Middle East and there they are much more accurate. So maybe the weather there is more easy to predict but they it's not going to be that in the morning they say that you have a clear day and in the afternoon you cannot go to lunch because of a storm uh different places in the world have different levels of predictability there's no question about it but they should always be probabilistic no matter where they are in the world um uh, certainly in dry climates it's a little bit easier uh yeah, so winter forecasts in florida uh, tend to have more skill uh, for longer leads. Summer forecasts have much less skill because it's a uh, the wet regime where we're driven by thunderstorms, which are very fast processes. So these are challenges, absolutely. Uh, so what do I mean by a first principle model or an F equals MA model? Uh, it's just uh, the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, this is just for the atmosphere. But a you know a proper weather and climate model, of course, has has uh, components for the the ocean, uh, the sea ice, the land surface processes, uh, uh, glaciers, all kinds of things. Um, and of course, you know, first principle models are are you know have some implied uh, uh, resolution, whether they're Galerkin methods or or grid point methods. They uh, have some implied resolution that's both in the horizontal and the vertical, and of course, an applied uh, an implied resolution in uh, time. Uh, we think we understand how to uh, put the dynamical uh, Navier-Stokes equations, uh, uh, how to solve those numerically with reasonable accuracy. Of course, we're limited by uh, computing power there, and the system is is uh, chaotic. 
it's a nonlinear dynamical system, so it's chaotic. So uh, very small perturbations or initial condition errors lead to large differences later in uh, time. Uh, just to give you an example of what we mean by predicting uh, 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 climate with weather within climate is sort of longer time scale. One of the things I'm going to sort of hammer in this is a seasonal forecast. So can I can I make a forecast of what uh, conditions might look like um, six months from today? And and of course, one of the things that you've heard a lot about in trying to make a forecast into the future is uh, El Nino. And uh, we're actually coming out of an El Nino right now and we're transitioning into a La Nina. This picture on the left-hand side is just, um, a for it's actually based on a forecast, a uh, forecast system here developed at the University of Miami. Uh, and uh, this is predicting one of the past El Ninos, one of the biggest El Ninos. And the black box I wanna, I'm gonna talk about actually it's you know it's in the middle of the ocean so you know on some level who cares but it's an example of why of what we're trying to predict in the in, in the distinction between weather and climate here that kind of makes sense and how we have to actually use a continuum to talk about that um and then the bottom picture of course is the model's forecast of a la nina the black box what i'm going to look at inside that black box is the rainfall it actually looks at how much it rains in that black box and so that's that's the forecast going out to uh, about four months of the rainfall in the black box. And so the uh, oval here is highlighting the earlier part of that forecast, the first couple of weeks. That's the that's the weather time scale. That's the you know day to day weather. And what you can see is we've made a an ensemble of forecasts, a bunch of different forecasts with small initial condition perturbations. And so if you look at the, the, the red dashed curves and the black line that's surrounding those red dashed curves, the, the forecast for that first 14 days or so, they, they uh, hang together. They're pretty close together. Uh, and uh, similarly with the, with the blue curve, they kind of hang together for maybe for just a few days, seven days maybe, right? So, so when there's that strong El Nino, the weather over that warm water that anomalously warm sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific, it rains a lot more. And in the blue case, it, it's much, much drier. And when you go out to longer time scales, the, you know, the red and the blue curves are totally all over the place. So, you know, one of these examples, it might be raining 18 millimeters per day and another one, six millimeters per day, totally different. But the red curves are pretty well separated from the blue curves, pretty well separated. And so it's that separation that we're predicting. So we would be predicting that, you know, during a, a La Nina, when it's cold in the tropical Pacific in that black box, it doesn't rain very much. And that's a robust prediction. And during an El Nino in that black box, you know, it rains a lot, deviates a lot from normal, so heavy rainfall. So the, the weather is, can we actually get the, the specific ups and downs? How, how close can we get? And then the climate part is, can we get that slowly evolving or can we get that separation between the blue and, and the red curve. So I can't forecast whether it's gonna rain at your particular location 120 days out, but I might be able to tell you it's gonna, there's a greater chance of it raining than normal or a less, a smaller chance than raining uh, a normal. So this is kind of the problem that we have to, we have to deal with. Uh, and just, just to let you know, uh, real nice thing is actually the University of Miami leads this, uh, we do this for NOAA. This is a, a, a project that we've uh, been leading since 2015, and that is to produce the operational forecasts that NOAA issues for what's going to happen the next season uh, or, or uh, you know, all the way out to 12 months. NOAA issues forecasts, and it's called the North American Multimodel Ensemble. It's led here at the University of Miami. Uh, sometimes I say NMME really fast, and it sounds like I'm saying enemy. I assure you, I'm very proud of this. It's not, it's not my enemy. I think it's one of the greatest things. Uh, we lead this effort, and um, the, the picture on the, on the right-hand side is showing you the uh, most recent forecast, a forecast issued in June for what's going to happen to those uh, sea surface temperatures. And what's 
what's showing you here is just it's it's a synthesis of a very large number uh, and a huge data set, terabytes of forecast data. And it's just trying to synthesize what's going to happen in the tropical eastern Pacific. And so the black curve there is showing you what's been happening in the past few months. And so that's the, the end of the, the El Nino and the models are forecasting a transition to uh, La Nina. Uh, some of these models uh, we run in-house here at the University of Miami and some are run by other uh, global, uh, you know, NASA runs one and NOAA runs one and the Canadians run one. Uh, and we and and uh, actually Noah runs two, and we we provide two here also. <clears throat> These are forecasts, and uh, what I want to emphasize here is, you know, I've tried to synthesize this down to a, you know, a spaghetti plot, and but the point I want to make here is that there's an enormous amount of data underlying this spaghetti plot, and we have barely scratched the surface. Uh, just honestly, barely scratched the surface in trying to uh, use data-driven techniques to try to pull out what's predictable and what isn't based on these set of forecasts. So this is the a point where I can say there's the possibility of a real revolution by letting the data drive the science as opposed to the first principles drive the science and just try to make you know a much better forecast based on these on these this this enormous fire hose of data. That's an open question, whether that's going to turn out to be useful or not. Uh, just so you know, uh, this is the, you probably already seen this on the news, this is the hurricane outlook. Uh, this outlook, this seasonal outlook is entirely based on that NMME project that we produce here at the University of Miami. So the, the fact that that system is, you know, predicting that uh, there's going to be an 85% chance of above, above normal season uh, this this hurricane season is entirely based on that NMME product that, that we produce here. And so the forecast is for something like 17 to 25 named storms. Um, again, a range as opposed to a definitive value. The climatology is uh, typically uh, uh, 12, 12 named storms. And so you can see hurricanes and, and major hurricanes. Okay, just a couple more examples of looking at, at some of these forecasts. This is um, a case uh, that happened in 2018. Uh, this is a, a picture, actually, this is from where I grew up uh, in Santa Barbara, uh, California. I, did, I didn't grow up in Montecito, but, but it's not far from where, uh, it's part of Santa Barbara County, but it's not far from where I, where I grew up. This is a, a small beach area. Uh, this is uh, a picture on the on the left hand side is from January 8th, and the picture on the on the right side is from January 25th after a major storm. Uh, I happen to be friends with someone who was really worried about about those uh, about the possibility of extreme storms, and so we 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 provided them with um, uh, in their professional life. Uh, they have uh, they manage homeless shelters, and and so they were really worried about these extreme rainfall. And we provided them uh, three weeks in advance that there was going to be uh, a big chance of uh, uh, flooding. Um, this was a major event for those folks in Santa Barbara. Several people died because of some of those mudslides. So it was a major event. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the 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 warning system we had in place to uh, to deal with that was probably insufficient at that time. Uh, her, the, amazingly enough, we can actually, actually think about long lead uh, hurricane forecasts to some to some degree. And this is a picture of, um, I believe this is Isaias, uh, Hurricane Isaias. The right hand panel is showing what actually happened, and the the left hand panel is showing these multi model uh, forecasts. They, you know, they don't predict the individual storms, but they do do capture this probability of uh, storm driven extreme rainfall that uh, cut through the uh, Southeast US all the way to the north, uh, Northeast uh, um, uh, during that period. So it's it's an increased probability of an extreme storm. Okay, so advancing in computing power is also is a major disruptor in this problem because uh, what I wanna argue is none of those models that we're using today are have sufficient resolution to capture some of the observed processes. So I wanna show you two quick uh, movies and hopefully this is working reasonably well. This is the boring movie, and I apologize, it's only a, a few 20 seconds long. 
Uh, this is a boring movie. This is showing you a simulation from a state-of-the-art climate model that's used for climate change projections, that's also used for uh, these forecasts I showed. And you could see it just, it, this is the surface currents, uh, the bright, brighter colors are stronger currents, the deeper blue colors are uh, very quiescent ocean. And you can see uh, the model has some representation of the Gulf Stream, but you can see the coastline is poorly represented and, and there's really just not much variability. We don't think that looks very realistic. And so if I'm trying to convince you, for example, that the Gulf Stream is important for capturing extreme rainfall in the Southeast US, you're gonna say, well, your model doesn't really have much of a Gulf Stream is what you would say to me. And so we've developed new technology, but based on better computing power and being able to solve these Navier-Stokes equations uh, uh, better. And so here's a, a, a more recent uh, model, next, the next generation. And you can see uh, this model produces much more realistic looking surface currents. It uh, produces the, in the Gulf of Mexico, these sort of loop current eddies. Uh, I view this as the, the Academy Award winning movie. Those loop current eddies, as you can see, shed and propagate across the Gulf, you can get actual hurricanes trapped into those because uh, those those eddies have a warm, really warm water core. And so the hurricanes can get trapped in those eddies. And you can just see something that's much, just much more plausible in terms of uh, uh, fidelity to what people think the real climate system looks like. And so when we try to use a system like this to predict weather and climate, we think we're doing a much better job. And the, the example of how these computational resources are are improving things comes from this uh, one element comes from this picture right here. And so what I'm showing you is uh, rainfall. These are pictures, the brighter colors are the stronger uh, rainfall. The bottom panel is an, an observed estimate of uh, rainfall from satellite data. And so that big, that big blob of straw, intense rainfall that sits right at that Gulf Stream front, where there's cold water to the north and very warm water to the south, and that rainfall is sitting right at that front, where that warm and cold water bump into each other. It's extreme rainfall, and so storms come off North America and they dump a huge amount of rainfall at that front. So the top panel, the solid colors, are showing you how, how well we capture that rainfall pattern in uh, that higher resolution model. And uh, the gray, uh, lighter contours are how that uh, rainfall front is uh, captured in the in the uh, in more standard climate model that's used today to make forecasts and do climate change research. And so, what you can see is that that rainfall is sitting in completely the wrong place. And so, when you think about, well, I'm trying to predict how that rainfall might vary and how it might affect rainfall uh, localized over the southeast U.S., for example, or something like that. When I have a model that puts the rainfall in completely the wrong place, you're unlikely to, to uh, trust it very much. And so this is an example of what I mean by that. So uh, this is uh, a rainfall variance on, on lower frequency timescales, but the same is true for higher frequency. The two, the two panels on the left are two different estimates of uh, observed rainfall. <clears throat> the two panels on the right are the <clears throat> excuse me are the rainfall from the high resolution model on the top and the low resolution model on the bottom. And so you can see this is rainfall variance. So this is you can think of this as you know how stormy things are. Does it capture where the storminess comes as opposed to the mean? And what you can see is the low resolution model puts too much of that storminess in the ocean and not enough storminess uh, variability, uh, if you will. <clears throat> into the where the where uh, in, in the southeast US. And this is a this is enormous problem. This is this is a hot spot in the US for extreme weather. This is a, a place where we do particularly poorly at predicting extreme weather. So this is, you know, in one sense, from my perspective, OK, this is low hanging fruit. If I can make progress of predicting extreme rainfall in the southeast, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something useful. But it's also a, a place where our tools uh, really don't do a very good job. And so one of the solutions is to to use a high resolution model and the other solution that I want to talk to talk about is as, as a disruptor. So the high resolution models of disruptor is a machine learning techniques to try to capture that that extreme rainfall. We'll talk about that. So one, you know, in all of this, you know, climate modeling stuff, 
uh, we always want to relate extreme rainfall to what's happening with ocean surface temperatures because that sort of that helps us that's where slow processes happen and that's usually our source of predictability and so this is a an in, a really interesting picture and it takes a takes a few moments to digest but uh, what we're looking at is how that rainfall in the southeast is related to sea surface temperatures around the globe. So I'm just plotting a correlation. Rainfall over that southeast region averaged, correlated with sea surface temperatures everywhere else in the globe. On the left-hand side here, I show two results. So the, the one that's labeled A, CMIP5, that is uh, a picture based on every credible climate model in the world, internationally, every single climate model world. There's 64 of them that go into that picture on the left. So it's an enormous amount of data. And what all across all those climate models say is that the rainfall in the Southeast US, is what the climate models say, this rainfall in the Southeast US seems to be connected to that big El Nino thing in the tropical Pacific. The LRC panel, the one that's labeled C, the one I you know, that we participates in this NMME project that's a standard resolution has a similar result. It says the important thing is the rainfall uh, to the rainfall is the sea surface temperatures in the uh, tropical Pacific driving the rainfall. Top right hand panel, however, is the um, uh, observational estimates. And so the observational estimates say the tropical Pacific doesn't really matter very much for the rainfall in the Southeast. What really might matter is something going on in the Atlantic, and we'll drill down to that. The uh, high resolution model captures that, perhaps too strongly, because you can see those, those colors in the Atlantic are perhaps too strong, but those 64 climate models and this you know, lower resolution version of the model we're running here, uh, are getting it absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong. Uh, okay, and uh, just, it's, you know, I can talk about all the physical mechanisms, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna move forward a little bit and and uh, talk about this problem <laughs> of predicting that. Zoom? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sure, sorry. Yeah, hey Ben, I think that's fascinating, right? So. Um, when we do data science and AI, um, typically, you know, when we come up with algorithms and or, or you know formulas, translate them to algorithms and models, we typically don't have the actual observability aspect that we can use to corroborate our our mod, our, you know, that our models are actually working. Here, obviously, we do. So the fact that the models that are being used, I know these are like holistic models that everyone uses. They're not models that we develop necessarily here, but if, if the models that we're using are not actually um, forecasting what's actually happening, do we understand why? What, what's wrong with the models? Uh, in, uh, yes, well, in this particular example, uh, I, I believe I understand what's going wrong, okay? Uh, but that's, uh, most of the time, I don't think we do. <laughs> So I think it's unusual that we understand, and I picked this example because I, I think we I think we understand. And it goes back to that picture that I uh, showed, you know, that movie I showed, where that one model had almost no current variability, and the other model had all this stuff going on. And what these low resolution models fail to resolve or capture are what's going on in the Atlantic with that current system and how that affects sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic and how that affects the atmosphere and the circulation that drives rainfall in the Southeast. So it's, it's, it's missing critical, a critical process, Gulf Stream variability in these lower resolution models. And the, the problem I think is really profound because, you know, when you think about climate change, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to provide localized information about what's going to happen as the climate changes. But if you're missing this critical process, how credible are we? So it's a, it's an, I think it's an enormous problem. 
We can talk about, you know, we're very good at saying what's going to happen to the global mean. But when we start talking regionally, boy, that's a much harder problem and it challenges our models much more. And this is an example of where the sort of standard, you know, common tools are really lacking. And we understand why, but there's many, many other phenomena in other parts of the globe where we don't. Uh, so how do we... How do we start? Where's this potential revolution that I keep talking about? Where's that going to start to, to come in? And I, I just want to, you know, from from the weather and climate community, I want to talk about how we, how at least my my sense of how we talk about these things. So, the traditional models are uh, uh, are developed in these sort of one off codes, as you noted. You know, these are codes that take many years to develop. Uh, uh, they evolve over time very, very slowly. So the, the the refresh cycle can be, you know, anywhere between five and 15 years or so. So, uh, you know, no NOAA, uh, the official uh, weather and forecast, uh, weather forecasting uh, entity of the government, their uh, uh, seasonal forecast system hasn't been updated since 2011. So, you know, it's quite a long time that that one hasn't been updated. Some of these models are complex or they're uh, one-off codes. Um, uh, uh, the machine learning approach is, you know, it's it's software that can, it's it's models that can be constantly updated as new data streams in. So much more reusable code, um, uh, much more flexible in terms of ingesting longer records and new data to train the system. Uh, uh, just to you know, so the data-driven approach is in, in many ways uh, simpler uh, than the traditional models. Uh, you know, from our perspective, when, you know, when we're seeing big in, in big big investments in, in computer architecture, the algorithms that we have for some of these older codes, these vectorized codes are, are uh, uh, not consistent with GPUs, the possibility of GP, GPUs and these architectural trends, whereas sort of machine learning is. One of the things that, um, I, th I think it could potentially revo revolutionize the way the weather and climate enterprises run is uh, really taking taking advantage of uh, GPUs uh, to do a significant part of the calculation, recognizing that the that the accuracy or the precision of the calculation does not need to be that good. It does not need to be 64 bit or what or 100, 132 bit or whatever. It's it's uh, because there's so much uncertainty there. Adding stochasticity by um, including uh, a computational uncertainty is is probably a good thing. In fact, uh, data is a problem with traditional models, and data is still a problem with machine learning. But um, I, um, you know, I would emphasize also an opportunity. I don't need to show you, uh, you know, what a neural network looks or random random tree looks like. So I want to I want to uh, stick with the southeast that's question. Good. Yeah, sorry, uh, Ben. One more question, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, the previous slide. Uh, I the you know uh, I understand the the approach historically has been to you know do these forecasts and put them on the newspaper or or the weather weather app or the news, right? And it's like you said, it's you know. Uh, very large scale sort of forecasts. Uh, at the end of the day, w when we think about how, how technology can directly affect the individual, like at the end of the day, from a very selfish perspective, I just want to know if I can have a barbecue this Sunday at home, if it's going to rain or if it's not. And right now we, we typically can't do that because it's not at that scale. I think that there's a huge amount of opportunity. I know, for example, that uh, in Fort, I live in Fort Lauderdale, in Fort Lauderdale, uh, the city is implementing, you know, there are new regulations. You got to have a swale in front of your house, which brings water down to the aquifer and, you know, reduces flooding. We're going to digital meters. We now have implemented all around the city digital water tables. So you can see at any point in time where the water tables are and one might be higher than the other. So you know exactly what could be flooding, you know, this, at this particular point in time compared to your neighbor down the street based on your water table. I think if, what you're saying is fascinating to me because, again, as an engineer, not a mathematician, I can see the real world applications of tying what you're showing us historically, what's been done 
to what's the, the way that the environment's changing from a technology perspective at the local level. So the fact in the, I can I can see how in the near future we might be able to say, yep, yeah, it's gonna rain Sunday from two to four in a week or two weeks and the water tables are here, you won't be flooded by your neighbor well. You know, we we will be able to plan in a better way at an individual level. Do you agree with that or not? Um that's that's precisely what we're trying to build. Um and in fact um we're uh, about to start a project that is trying to uh, do precisely that uh, for uh, for the state of Florida. So this would be state funding to build a uh, to build a system that can produce a sort of a neighborhood by neighborhood guidance on how much it's going to uh, you know the the a probabilistic forecast of how much it's going to rain the next two weeks, six months, five years, 10 years, 30 years out in particular locations. Um, and these are core, you know, you know, when you go for very long, you're talking about time average, you know, probabilities as opposed to short time. So it's precisely what we're trying to build, uh, that kind of system. Uh, we, we honestly uh, think we can do it, but we don't know if we have uh, sufficient data or uh, sufficient computing infrastructure, uh, what sacrifices we're going to have to make in terms of, you know, fidelity uh, and things like that. But that is precisely what we're trying to do. And we're trying to do it in collaboration with the people, you know, who have to manage uh, water uh, for, you know, uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale, for example. Okay, so I want to I want to try something really. Uh, I want to do something really simple uh, with machine learning here, and this is this is um, an example of uh, you know how uh, I think taking a real raw uh, let the data drive things approach um, is is uh, uh, potentially going to revolutionize things. So the the traditional, even though it's a short time period, the traditional approach for us predicting, say, just the sign of the rainfall anomaly. Is it is the rainfall larger or smaller than normal on any particular day over the area average rainfall over this sort of southeast US region? Yeah, really simple, gross. This whole region, all the all the land points, take them all, take the average. Is it above normal or below normal? 50-50 chance, right? So pretty simple you would think. And uh, what I want to sort of slam is we've tried this for years and years uh, using uh, fully connected neural network models, uh, logistic regression. It doesn't work. There's no skill whatsoever. None. And I'm going to show you an example of that. But, but if we just take our biases away, they are biases how to formulate and how to do this and just say, let's just let the data do it. Just let the data tell us what's important. It works. It actually works. There is some predictability and it connects to some of those high resolution model results. There's a nice connection there. So we really have a lot of confidence in it, but we just sort of have to push back and say, let's not let our, our biases, our intuition, which is totally biased, influence how the uh, uh, how the machine learning model is 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 put together, and so it's just a really nice example there of let the data drive all by itself. So you know, just a just you guys know this much better, but this is a you know just setting up a linear regression, uh, logistical regression, and a fully connected neural network model in the yellow ovals uh, along the right hand, uh, the left hand side in both of these panels, I have this uh, 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 climate index zoo, uh, as I like to refer to it. So uh, the one that says Nino uh, 3.4, that's, you know, are we going to have an El Nino or not, right? Uh, the NAO is a, is a climate index that represents uh, circulation in the North Atlantic the AMO is another one. The, the one that's labeled PDO, that's something that happens in the North Pacific. And then uh, RMM is, uh, you know, uh, intraseasonal variability. It's called the Madden-Julian oscillator. So these are indices that describe, that we've used historically for any number of years to describe the climate system. You know, if you have an El Nino, it tends to rain more in Southern California, for example. 
the what we're predicting is green is you know more rainfall than normal so and 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 brown is drier than normal and so uh these are you know 50 50 chance of each one and so can we can we do a better job of capturing it? so pretty simple using these climate indices to predict the rainfall linear regression fully connected neural network model and so here's the results so uh, uh this is showing trying to to LR stands for linear logistic regression here, and FCNNN stands for the fully connected neural network model. And uh, the accuracy here, uh, you can see, is completely centered around 50%. So I would say there's no accuracy at all, right? You know, if I'm getting it right 50% of the time, and there's a 50-50 chance, then I have no, no accuracy. The right-hand side is what is what we call in the weather and climate community called reliability. Uh, reliability for a decision maker is really, really important, just as important as as of accuracy. And what reliability is asking is, uh, is the forecast probability similar to the observed probability? And so the diagonal black line would say that the forecast probability and the observed probability are coming out to be about the same. And so that's a that's a reliable system. It predicts the you know the probability of an outcome happening about the same as the observed probability. That's what decision makers really like. A flat line implies here that there's no reliability at all. So not only do we have no accuracy uh, using these standard indices, whether it's logistical regression or con convolution neural network or fully connected neural network, whatever. Uh, we have no accuracy and no reliability. And so what the climate community would do at this point in time is they would stop. We would stop. Easy problem, easy problem, no skill, no predictability. We would conclude that you can't do this problem. Despite the fact that I showed all those high resolution model results, it seems to say there's something there. So it seems to say something there, but our usual indices, our bias of using indices is telling us there's nothing there. So we would stop. We would quit. However, if you if you take an ag more you know instead of using those indices, you take a, a more, much more agnostic you know uh, in terms of what's important, and you just start putting in all the data, the atmospheric circulation, the sea surface temperature, the uh, radiation going to space. You just put in everything. Boom, fully all the grid points, and then you build a convolution neural network model, and you use that to make the prediction. Now, right, we look at the accuracy and uh, the reliability, and notice now the accuracy has shifted uh, much, much away from 50%. So now we're doing, you know, when we're making a 50-50 call, we're right 70% of the time or 60% of the time. That implies there's some accuracy. There's some reason to believe it. And uh, when you look at the reliability, you can see we're getting much, much closer to lying on the diagonal. So the forecast probability and the observed probabilities are lining up. And so this is just entirely based on letting the, the data drive everything. And so the critical thing then is, you know, okay, we can make a better prediction. That's fantastic. <laughs> but if we don't understand that prediction, if we don't, you know, then who's going to believe us? Who's going to trust us? And so one of the things that's become really popular in in um, in uh, uh, weather and climate is to look at heat maps that basically decompose the uh, neural network model and ask what's important. And this is this layer-wise relevance propagation. So this is a heat map, and the the uh, color contours are the geopotential height, uh, the up uh, sort of the which gives you a sense of the circulation. Uh, these are highs and lows, so you know circulation around a high is is clockwise, and circulation around a low is counterclockwise. So the red contours correspond to clockwise circulation, and the blue contours correspond to counterclockwise circulation. The gray contours are showing you what where is that important? Where is that? Where are those winds and circulation patterns important? And what you can see, um, get this to drill down a little bit. What you can see in the summertime anyways, uh, the uh, rainfall in the Southeast really cares about that circulation in the Atlantic. 
And that's coming from that Gulf Stream. That connection between the atmosphere and the ocean associated with the Gulf Stream is really driving this uh, height pattern, which is connected directly to uh, rainfall in the southeast. And so that's, and you can see those green arrows, that's what's bringing moisture into the southeast that's producing the enhanced rainfall. So we can understand that. Uh, same kind of thing in the winter, but in this case, the moisture is coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Moisture is coming from the Gulf of Mexico. So we can make predictions in the winter and summer on this really simple problem, whether how useful that information is to a decision maker is an open question, but at least we can do a whole lot better than nothing. Uh, I know I'm running low on time, but I, I want to, uh, that's sort of just letting the data drive everything. Where I really think the revolution is coming is in how to use these data-driven techniques embedded in the first principle models. And so what you see with this first principle model is there's all of these physical processes, clouds, precipitation, radiation, and it gets even more complicated there's uh, rivers and glaciers and human influence and atmosphere uh, chemical composition and land ice sheets. Uh, very, very complicated. It's this stuff that we do a terrible job of understanding in our climate models, that we do a terrible job of modeling. And we make it's really art how we put these things in the models. But I think we can we can do that with data driven techniques. And there's two potential advantages here by combining these data-driven techniques to do the physics inside the models is that one, they're much faster. They're gonna be much, much faster than we do it in, in our attempt to do it in first principles. And, and two, um, they are, there's the possibility of building much better models. And so this is, uh, you know, it's not important, but it's how uh, surface friction is modeled, land surface friction is modeled in, in, in some of our climate models. And uh, we, we can estimate the, uh, that surface friction uh, based on large scale variables. The left hand panel is showing doing that with a neural network, uh, I'm sorry, a random forest model. The far right hand panel is showing you how well we do that with a, a neural network model. So it's comparing the, the the, neuro, the, the, the machine learning models to the observed frequency. And then the middle panel is our first principle model. And so you can see we're actually getting, uh, uh, we're getting uh, more accurate. Uh, we're getting a higher concentrations along the axis, you know, the, the one, one line uh, with the, with the neural network model, the random forest model compared to the uh, first principles model. And these, two random forest and neural network models are two orders of magnitude faster. Two orders of magnitude faster. So that's a that's a, uh, a really uh, uh, potentially gonna revolutionize our weather and climate models. So I'm not wasting computational resources on this part of the physics. I can put it into the dynamics that, that we think we understand, but need to do a better job of resolving. And this is not just those those particular, this is looking at how we do clouds, uh, uh, low clouds, uh, the total, uh, how clouds interfere with sunlight coming in and how well we model uh, uh, the liquid water path in the atmosphere. And so the top row here is showing you the results from the machine learning model. The bottom row here is showing you the first principle model. And then the third row is showing you the difference. And so we really are, doing, uh, we're developing these machine learning techniques to capture some of the physics in the models much better, much faster. And that I think is gonna uh, lead to a real revolution. And so just, you know, my, again, my, you know, soapbox here, I think uh, there's really uh, the potential for a, a, a revolution in how we do climate, weather and climate modeling, but also how we do weather and climate education. There's this, a real opportunity to uh, blend, you know, computational expertise, machine learning, and domain science all together, and really start doing some really interesting uh, science and education. And uh, last, I'll just show you the most recent forecast. This is a forecast for this summer. The left-hand panel shows you the surface temperatures that we're forecasting around the globe. Uh, so you can see it's very, very. Uh, we're predicting it to be very, very warm in the Atlantic, and in fact. 
that main development region is uh, anywhere between one and two degrees above normal Celsius. So really quite warm. And then the uh, right-hand panel is showing you the rainfall forecast uh, in probabilities. Uh, and so there's a significant uh, probability that here in the Southeast, the rainfall will be above normal. And with that, I will finish. Thank you, Vincent.